we hear p- certain cardiologists saying lower and earlier the better and emphasizing this idea of primordial prevention so how do we how do we balance i guess what the, where the guidelines are indicating kind of stepping in with ldl cholesterol lowering medications versus acting very early and being kind of super cautious with this disease process yeah so my advice is read the guidelines so you understand them but then pretty much ignore them in the real world clinical practice i want to point you to a just published editorial written by the president of the American Society for Preventive Cardiology, Mike Shapiro. And the title of that editorial was Rethinking the Starting Point. And that means we can't wait till your 10-year risk assessment is going to tell me you're at high risk. We have to recognize the causal biomarkers of atherosclerotic coronary disease very early in life and then jump in with therapeutics, which could be lifestyle, but in many people it is going to be drug use at a much earlier age, and they would never qualify for drug use using any of the existing guidelines. So uh, using my example that you quoted nicely, the hypobetas don't get atherosclerotic heart disease, those we, that a good clinician can ascertain is at cardiovascular risk using a variety of biomarkers, imaging not too much in a young person, a family history, blah, blah, blah. We can, uh, I think, going to have to start with the therapies much earlier in life if we're ever going to take out this disease. People will start quoting number needed to treat and that sort of stuff that has no (laughs) meaning to me. We start with the generic therapies. The cost is infinitesimal, and that is no longer a reason not to use the starting drugs. They're incredibly safe. Statins have been around for 38 years now, used by millions of people, tested in more clinical trials than probably any other class of drugs ever. The azetamide, not up to that part yet, but it's been around over 20 years now, and we certainly don't have any bad safety signals for that. So I think we're on pretty safe ground identifying earlier in life the people who need it, certainly not waiting for a 10-year risk assessment, which is pretty much based on age or gender and figuring out who to treat. So that's just, that's sometimes called, uh, Dan will get a shiver up his spine, but medicine 3.0, thinking outside the box, but thinking intelligently. Can I respond to that? <laughs> of course, Dan. That's why you're here. You're 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 here to to, to and chime remember, in wherever you want. He's a former president of the NLA. He's got to talk in certain directions. I don't. I'm quite comfortable going beyond the guidelines. I I haven't quite gone to gotten to the level where I say throw out the guidelines. <laughs> but I but your point is taken, Tom. That that guidelines are written by especially the way they're written now spearheaded by the AHA, ACC, and up to 10 other medical societies, so, so-called multi-society input. They are, they're written by committee, so there has to be a consensus on decisions. They are fully established based upon randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials with cardiovascular outcome data and meta-analyses of the same and so they have a very high evidentiary level to be to take into consideration the evidence and so because of that you know some of the concepts that you bring up about you know 30 year data and and other information like that can't find its way into the guideline but in nowhere does in the guideline does it say do not prescribe if if there is someone's risk is calculated below a certain range. It just says that it tells us when to prescribe, not when not to prescribe necessarily. So there's, it's not proscriptive. It's, it's really prescriptive. But most people do take that as a reason not to prescribe, at least those who want to quote the guidelines. I agree. And, and, and the, the, the reality is, is that in, in a real world application, you do need, you do need some rules to live by. And a general rule of thumb of everybody needs a lower LDL and everybody should take medicine unless they have hypobeta lipoproteinemia, which I'm not saying that's what you said, but, but like that's way too liberal. As a matter of fact, you and I and Simon have talked about whether Simon should be on medicine and he's not, we're not even talking about primordial prevention with Simon. And it's still an issue because he is has dedicated his life to 
nutritional practice. And there's some implications for a soon to be 40 year old man with some plaque starting a statin drug that, that go beyond his own just personal needs. So there, life is complicated. Individuals definitely need options to use therapy, but they need some guidelines to use as the, as the walls of, upon within which we make decisions. So I, I wouldn't, all I'm saying is I'm not ready to throw out the guidelines, but I, but I want everyone to understand that just because it's not stated explicitly in the guideline doesn't mean you can't do it. That's an important clarification. If I was to kind of throw a question back at you to bring this down to clinical practice, let's say we have a, a 30 year old who's listening to this, who is low risk by definition, doesn't have diabetes. They haven't been scanned, so we don't know that they have plaque, but they have no prior history of a cardiac event and they have no family history of cardiovascular disease and no other risk factors like high blood pressure or smoking or alcohol or insulin resistance. But their LDL cholesterol is sitting at 125, 130. And I'm bringing this case study up because this is an example of a friend of mine. And he is wondering, should I, should I use a lipid lowering medicine? He's only 30 years old. He has modified his diet, but he's not really willing to modify it any further than where it's at. This is sustainable for him. And he's interested in whether the addition of a statin plus or minus some other lipid lowering medicine is going to help him get into his 60s and 70s in better health at lower risk of, of having a cardiac event. And he's asked me that, and and I've gone back with looking at the the guidelines, and it, it's a hard it's a hard question to answer when you look at the guidelines. Well, it's not hard for me. <laughs> this is a guy again using. Uh, it's time to rethink and start. I see zero downside to start him on the type of initial ApoB lowering drugs that uh, we we just mentioned or so, and drop that down to a safer. I don't know that you have to take him to a hypo beta level, but dropping his LDLC, what'd you say it was 120 down to 70? I, I see zero reason not to do that. Cost is not a reason. Side effects are not a reason. And what are you losing in the process there? So to me, that's a person. Those are the type of people we're missing now. That's the type of man when he is forty or fifty, and you do those LDL year calculations, is going to be entering a threshold where he, his CTA looks like yours. So why wait? That person comes to me and says, "I'm willing to take a medicine. Do you think I ought to?" The answer is, "Well." And you asked whether the guidelines suggest whether they should. The the answer is no. The guidelines do not recommend use of medicine in that particular patient. But if that person says to me, I'd like to start a statin and or some other LDL lowering therapy, I have no problem with that for the reasons that Tom just described. But, it, but I wouldn't necessarily go out of my way to prescribe it for that person. When it comes to gut health, I couldn't find a supplement that did it all. So I formulated one with gastroenterologist, Dr. Will Bolsowitz. It's called Daily Microbiome Nutrition or DMN by 38 Terra. And to our knowledge, it is the most complete prebiotic formula on the market today. We built DMN to support a healthy, diverse microbiome, which we now know plays a critical role in everything from digestion to immunity, metabolism, and even brain health. What sets DMN apart is that it contains clinically proven doses of ingredients like actazin and solanol, and it's a very concentrated source of polyphenols, all conveniently combined to nourish your gut bacteria and promote true microbial diversity. No artificial sweeteners, no gums or fillers, just science-backed plant-based ingredients in a once a day, incredibly delicious drink. So if you're looking to fuel your microbes and enjoy all the benefits that come with that, head to 38terra.com and use the code SIMON for 10% off. That's 38tera.com and use the code SIMON to feed those gut bugs.